Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to tonight's uh, regular meeting of the Village, village uh, Mayor and Board of Trustees. Uh, it is November 9th. Of course, our first uh, order of business uh, is to have the Pledge of Allegiance, and we are going to be led tonight um, by an Elm School uh, student named Shay Doshi. He's here today with his brother and his parents. Uh, per his uh, principal, uh, Gina Considine, Shay is an excellent uh, fifth grader. Uh, is a, and uh, per his mom, it was Bajal Bova Doshi. She is very excited to, uh, he, Shay is very excited to lead the pledge uh, today. Uh, he's uh, 10 years old, fifth grader at Elm School. He lives in Burr Ridge for the last six years. Favorite classes are science and math. He plays travel soccer, enjoys playing basketball. He especially is excited about soccer. I, I talked to him earlier. And uh, at Elm, he recently began saxophone lessons in choir. He's a, he is a lunch buddy to first, second, and third graders. He's participating in the Battle of the Brooks for the second year. He loves to read and travel, and he has, a, he has one younger brother. His grandparents have lived in Burr Ridge for almost 30 years. So, Shay, uh, could you uh, uh, lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Shay. And not everybody gets to do it right before Veterans Day, so that's especially significant today. All right, may I have a roll call, please? Trustee Francis. Here. Trustee Grasso. Here. Trustee Pavesa. Here. Trustee Bolas. Here. Trustee Murphy. Trustee Schiappa. Here. Mayor Straub. Here. The, uh, uh, the first uh, thing that we're going to do this evening uh, is uh, have a moment of silence uh, for a, uh, a uh, employee that, uh, we, that, that the village lost uh, this, uh, this week. Uh, many of you may have already known her, uh, Susan Ruiz. She was part-time community development uh, director <coughs> of the department, uh, administrative secretary. Uh, she passed away following an extended illness, and she worked uh, for many years for uh, Doug Pollock. Uh, she's been with us since 2008, as, and it was a tremendous uh, asset to the village and front office, as well as a valued backup for the front desk at the public works department when needed. Uh, she was you know, loved by all and would deeply, be deeply missed. Uh, she was really a, just, just a close friend to, to so many people in the village. Uh, including ourselves who knew her back in the back in the softball days and as well as to other people I know in the village like uh, uh, Planning Commissioner uh, Bob Grella uh, many people will miss her as we all were especially people that worked with her for so many years and, and in the office so I'd like to have a moment of silence uh, in honor and in memory of uh, Susan Ruiz We thank you for that, and uh, please keep her, her, uh, her family, her husband uh, Frank, and her two daughters in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, by the way, Susan was also a longtime uh, resident of Burr Ridge as well. But uh, <coughs> your thoughts and prayers, please. Okay, the uh, next order of business, of course, is the uh, portion for the residents' comments. Uh, are there any uh, members of the, of the audience that are residents that would like to address the board at this time. <coughs> My name is Tom White. Um, I'm a former member of the Bur Burr Ridge Police Pension Fund. <clears throat> I met for about two hours last week with the village administrator and the finance director regarding the police pension situation. 
primary reason for the meeting was to better understand their differing opinions relative to the ongoing health of the pension fund. <clears throat> Specifically, their contention is that there are surpluses which are projected long into the future. I contend that there are no surpluses, but only a growing deficit. Furthermore, the last two years, trust fund assets were liquidated in order to meet expenses. I finally understand where they're coming from. <clears throat> the confusion is with regard to the type of, of uh, business the pension fund represents. To them, we're like a company selling widgets who have been stockpiling our profits, which we reinvest in the financial markets. The widget company's most recent year indicates that its expenses exceeded income by 71,000. However, it made a little over a million on its investment portfolio, and so there is a surplus. At the start of the year, the widget business had 14 million in assets. At the end of the year, 15. How do you spell surplus? The only problem is we're not in the widget business. Pension fund business is more like that of an insurance company. Assets need to be set aside to cover the policies that have been sold. <clears throat> in the last fiscal year, the deficit, the difference between what we have and what we need to have, grew by almost $600,000, bringing the fund's deficit to just under $6.4 million. Growing deficit, not surplus. A village administration using nothing short of smoke and mirrors by citing irrelevant data. The village administration did, however, acknowledge that the village <clears throat> will make good on the officers' pensions. The recent state Supreme Court decision makes that perfectly clear. Village administrator then expressed to my amazement his understanding that ramp funding is the normal funding strategy for pension funds. That in the first 20 years of 30 year pension fund, for example, deficit is allowed to grow annually. Easing the required village contribution in the early years, eventually in the last 10 years, contributions have sufficiently escalated to reduce the deficit, thus achieving the funding goal. That reminds me of a story my father told me more than 60 years ago. He was coming back from Wisconsin, <clears throat> and he got stopped for speeding. He had to return to court in Wisconsin. The uh, individual that was before him in court, the judge said to him, he says, I see that you've, uh, you're doing 80 and 60, but that isn't really what bothers me. What bothers me is you tried to bribe the police officer. Before I throw the book at you, can you, uh, uh, you, you wanna say anything on your own behalf? He says, Your Honor, I'm sorry, but that's what we do in Illinois. How are things working in Illinois? <clears throat> I think that everyone knows that we have the worst funded public pensions in the nation, bar none. Illinois service providers wait months, sometimes years to be paid. Springfield budget crisis is primarily driven by an ever increasing annual pension funding juggernaut, primarily due to the use of ramp funding. Illinois police pension epidemic has been allowed to spread to the municipal police and fire funds. Some of Illinois villages have prudently realized the impending disasters. Others like us, not so much. Real shame is we don't need to change the state law in order to fund the police pension on a pay-as-you-go basis. I'm not even suggesting that a tax increase is necessary, but we need to stop balancing the village budget on the back of the pension fund. Just a, year, a few years ago, it was necessary to cut the equivalent of nine full-time staff positions, put off capital projects, eliminate travel. Could have been worse, but the village was able to unilaterally reduce the required pension funding. As of next year's budget, that option is no longer available. I can't believe we want to make financial crisis the norm, <clears throat> where every year we are facing with the required pension um, contributions <clears throat> overwhelms the budget. The clock is ticking, deficit is building, and like a bowler picking up momentum, <clears throat> it will come crashing down on us, or more likely on the next de decade's village board and Burr Ridge residents. So my recommendation- have, You have a one minute warning. Just my one recommendation minute is that you levy the uh, police pension fund Levy at the Gatsby minimum, pardon me, the Gatsby uh, statement amount, which is 798,544. We're not in the widget, widget business. Um, the packet that I gave you, there's <clears throat> six pages, double sided, copy of, copy of my formal remarks. You know, my municipal police pension, what went wrong and who shares the responsibility? Searching for pension surpluses in the growing deficit. Where have the current year's pension contributions gone? Cash summary of operations versus what I would consider pension fund accounting. And this year's reconciliation of the increasing deficit. Later, the village administration will show you their numbers. So plus is no doubt, nothing to worry about. We had another good year and the future looks the same. I wonder if they'll have a slide that shows a deficit increase by almost 600,000 to $6.366 million. Or that the actuary cites the village ramp plan funding with being the cause of 260,000 of the added deficit. Thank you. Thank you. 
there anyone else, any other residents who would like to address the board at this time? Okay, what I'd like to do is uh, move on to the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk, of course, are considered routine by the village board and will, will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member uh, or citizens have request in which event the item will, will, be, will be removed. Under uh, minutes, we have approval of a regular board meeting of October 26, 2015. Uh, B is receive and file a Veterans Memorial Committee meeting on August 26, 2015. And C, uh, receive and file a uh, Veterans Memorial Committee meeting of September 30th, 2015. Under ordinances, we have approval of an ordinance granting a special use pursuant to the Burr Ridge Zoning Ordinance to permit additions to an existing hotel, a remodeling of the building facade, that's uh, Z-13-2015, located at 15W300 South Frontage Road, uh, Vega Hospitality, otherwise known as uh, Quality Inn, now the Oaks Hotel. Uh, under 6B, we have uh, approval of an ordinance granting variations pursuant to the Burr Ridge Zoning Ordinance to increase the maximum <coughs> floor, ratio, floor area ratio for a hotel to approximately point, uh, 0 0.42 rather than the permitted uh, 0 0.40 and to reduce the required parking from approximately <coughs> 212 parking spaces required to 205. I uh, provided uh, that uh, that's number Z-13-2015 at the same address, 15 West 300 South Frontage Road uh, the Vega Hospitality or Quality Inn. Under uh, resolutions, uh, we have uh, under 7B, adoption of a resolution authorizing antenna license uh, agreement a uh, water tower located at 16 W0 50 83rd Street, the Windstream, formerly the business only Broadland, Broadband. We have the uh, 7C, Adoption of resolution authorizing antenna license agreement, water tower, uh, also 7101 Garfield Avenue, Windstream, formerly uh, business only broadband. Under considerations, uh, we have 8C, approval of recommendation to hire replacement part-time administrative secretary in the community development uh, department. We have uh, 8D, approval of recommendation to a reaccount to reappoint Pat List to the Pathway Commission for a three-year term expiring September 10th, 2018. AD, approval, rec approval of recommendation to reappoint Mary, Mary Lou McGurr to the Pathway Commission for a three-year term expiring September 10th, 2018. 8F, approval of recommendation to reappoint Todd Davis to the Pathway Commission for a three-year term expiring September 10th, 2018. 8G, Approval recommendation to, re to reappoint John Pacoca uh, to the Pathway Commission for a three year term expiring September 10th, 2018. 8H, I might have a question about this one. Approval recommendation to reappoint me uh, to the Veterans Memorial Committee uh, for a three year term expiring September 30th, 2019. Four year term. After a four year term. And we have uh, approval of recommendation to reappoint Russell Smith, also <coughs> the Veterans Memorial Committee, for a four year term expiring September 30th, 2019. Under uh, AJ, we have uh, approval of request for a raffle and chance license for St. Uh, Alphonsus St. Patrick School and a hosting facility license for Chicago Marriott Southwest at Burr Ridge for the school's gala fundraiser on, on February 27th, 2016. Ticket sales between November 19th, uh, 2015, and, and February 26th, 2016, drawing an event on February 27th, 2016. Also under considerations, approval of vendor list uh, in the amount of $310,694.03 for all funds, plus $194,219.39 for payroll, for a grand total of $504,913.42 which includes special expenditures of $64,641.50 to Central Blacktop Company Incorporated for payment number three, the final on the 2015 road program, and $139,915 to TK Rush Truck Center for a 2015 International 7400 plow. That was a, a day. May I have a motion 
to approve the following moment, the following items on the consent agenda. That will be 5A, 5B, 5C. Under ordinances, 6A and 6B. Under resolutions, 7B, 7C. Under considerations, uh, 8C, 8D, 8E, 8F, 8G, 8H, 8I, 8J, and 8K. I have a motion to approve those. Second. Roll call, please. Trustee Beveza. Yes. Trustee Grasso. Yes. Trustee Francis. Yes. Trustee Bolas. Yes. Trustee Schiappa. Yes. Five zero. Those items passed. Motion to five zero. And now we move to under resolutions. We have a seven A. Consideration of adoption of resolution of the village of Burr Ridge, DuPage, and Cook Counties, Illinois, supporting pre uh, preservation of local revenue and calling for the release of state collected revenues owed to local governments. Steve? Yes. As the board is aware, the state is currently withholding the local share of um, several taxes, municipal use tax, motor fuel tax, 911 surcharges, federal STP funds, and uh, also gaming revenues. Burr Ridge, like uh, all villages and cities throughout the state, are impacted by the loss of this revenue and is finding it harder and harder each year to balance its budget even without the threat of the revenue uh, uh, loss from the state. This in mind, we've enclosed a resolution uh, prepared by the DuPage mayors and managers uh, uh, <coughs> group to um, support the preservation of local revenue and calling for the re release of state collected revenues owed to local government. The resolution supports the goals of balancing the state budget and ensuring that the financial systems of the state are sustainable. It also endeavors to work closely with the governor and the General Assembly to identify solutions to the state's financial crisis that do not undermine the ability of municipalities to provide essential services to constituents, while at the same time calling upon the governor and General Assembly to take action to immediately release all revenues owed to local government. We're happy to answer any questions. This is a resolution that uh, many municipalities in DuPage County will be uh, approving, uh, as I hope we will, uh, to call attention to the issue, you know, let our residents know uh, that this is an issue of concern. Uh, and we hope if it does pass tonight uh, that we would uh, put it on our website, uh, put it in our e-briefs, and uh, communicate to our residents, you know, the concerns that we have. <coughs> I think there's very little we can do. It's all in the governor's hands. And the least we can do is join in this resolution and hope that uh, he reads it, you know, that he understands we need it, we want it. I move we pass the resolution for the preservation of local revenue released to local governments. I'll second that. Any discussion on the motion? The topic? May I have roll call, please? Trustee Bolas. Yes. Trustee Grasso. Yes. Trustee Francis. Yes. Trustee Paveza. Yes. Trustee Schiappa. Yes. 5 0. <coughs> Resolution passes 5 0. Thank you very much. Uh, we are on to considerations. Uh, considera 8A consideration of recommendation to award contract for 2015 tree removal. And we are joined today by. Yeah. Thank you, Dave Pricey, Public Works Director and Village Engineer. Um, as you know, in about 2013, we started our EAB, Emerald Ash Borer Managed Decline Program. At that time in 2013, we took that inventory of our ash trees, and we had approximately 2,150 such trees. Um, that's about 18% of our total parkway tree population of about uh, 12,100 trees. The, uh, that Managed Decline Program decided to treat about 850 of those parkway ash trees, which left um, about 1,300 untreated. How they decided on that 850 was that it was uh, the, the best condition ash trees that were 12 inches or larger. Um, now Arborist inspects our parkway ash trees uh, twice each year. In 2014, for example, in September 14, he found about 114 trees <coughs> that were in decline and needed to be removed. Um, they were removed this past spring in 2015 and summer 2015 uh, for a contracted amount of $33,450. In, uh, in spring and then the number of ash trees that he noted had declined, and he wrapped up his uh, uh, his inventory of, of declined ash trees of, in, uh, in July and August and found about a total of 375 uh, of those parkway ash trees had declined to a point of about 30% canopy die-off and should be removed. Um, held off in hopes of uh, 
getting better prices this winter. And so we such as prepared a, a contract document. We opened bids on November 4th uh, to remove 375 trees. Uh, 10 bids were received. The lowest uh, responsive and responsible bid from Desiderio Landscaping of Grant Park, Illinois was in the amount of $78,000. $566.40, and we ask for your consideration to award that contract tonight. Um, that does put things a little bit over budget. The budget in the FY1516 uh, for tree removal was about $59,000. Again, we spent $33,450 for that first contract. Um, this additional cost of $78,566 would put us over budget by a, a little more than $53,000. Um, but we did save a little bit this year in the cost of treatment. Um, also in, in tree uh, replacement, if we held off until the, the spring and the next budget year of May 1, that would be a, a savings of about another 15,000. Um, all told with this contract to remove trees this year, um, our budget over would be about $32,030. Um, I can answer any questions at this time. Trustees, uh, Trustee Grosso. Our only choice <coughs> is to either cut them down or let them stand bare, dead, to facing the village, right? I mean, that's, that's right. It. It, uh, They're not going to come back to life, right? I mean, this is it. There's nothing we can do. Um, at 30% canopy dieback, they're, they're uh, in quick decline. Yeah. And, uh, and they're not hazardous. I mean, they're not falling over at that point. Um, they're not losing their bark as such, but they do, uh, they're, they're unsightly. Well, I also learned the hard way, <clears throat> excuse me, that if you don't cut down a tree while there's some life in it, <clears throat> If you let it get really brittle, a lot of tree people will not cut it down or will charge you a premium because it's more dangerous for them to climb them. Now, maybe that's not an issue with the size of the trees we're talking about, but um, this managed decline, you know, it still <clears throat> bothers me because I don't think we're going to, I mean, I hope we save them. I've got some ash in my at my house, but um, we also don't want to pay to cut them all down in one year. Right, so we're just hoping that the rest of them, many of them will survive, but I guess we have to cut these down because we have no choice. Right. The vast majority of these trees are the ones that we're not treating. I think we've only lost, according to Gary, about 5% of the trees that we are treating. Uh, so, okay. so the program is working for those that we anticipated trying to save. Uh, but these are the trees that we left untreated. <laughs> And they're just dying off faster yeah. than we had anticipated, but we knew they were going to die off. And as you indicated, uh, you really can't leave these dead trees uh, sitting there. The residents really have been calling and, and, and wondering when we're going to be removing these trees. So um, it's something we absolutely have to do. Uh, <clears throat> just to reiterate, the trees that are dying or died, we calculated some kind of a formula to we would have an idea of which ones would be more uh, uh, possible to save than uh, just let just go and say we'll go with this one, we'll go with that one. I mean, this was done scientifically. I just wanted the people to know we just didn't uh, go haphazardly about it. Exactly. Back when the initial um, condition survey was performed, they took the, the trees that were 12 inches or larger were more robust, um, so they were treated. It's a root drench program. Um, that, that treatment seems to have done very well. Again, about 5% dieback. We expect that over the next year, um, almost the, all of the remainder of the untreated trees will die. Um, so we went out for prices with this current proposal to just get prices for next year. We have that option to renew it at that price or just uh, peruse it as a budget number um, to remove about another 450 trees next fiscal year. So the, the Cost the bottom line cost of the winter tree removal will be thirty-two thousand, or will we only be over budget by thirty-two thousand. We'll only be that? over thirty-two thousand because of some savings, and the fact that instead of buying trees in April, we'll buy them in May, and it won't affect this fiscal year. So, are we awarding the contract to Desiderio for the winter and the spring bid? No, we just we just got those numbers just to, to see how they they panned out. When we know how many trees we're actually going to need to remove in the spring, then we'll come back. You rebid it. Well, we, if, if we elected that the contractors performed good service, um, they did come in at the lowest price for the next year. Um, and again, this will be more of an immediate contract that we'll know, you know, roughly after mid-May, Mother's Day, approximately, how many ash trees have died at that point after they've leafed out. So we'll be able to jump on it right away with a renewal. 
yeah, I'd like to use this company, assuming they do well for us. Um, you know, they're a reputable company, um, but assuming they do well for us, we'd like to use them again. They are the low bid. And um, we'd like to, like, like Dave said, we'd like to get a jump on this next year for those trees that we, we see died over the winter. Okay. Yeah. I was. I'm sorry. No, I'm done. Thank you. So, how many trees are coming down in the winter versus potentially in the summer? Okay, uh, the contract to remove them in the winter is about 375 trees. Okay. Um, if we have a mild winter, Public Works can jump on some of those too. Uh, our contract for the summer then, starting around June 1, would be about 450 trees. But that's just a, an estimated number, of course, right. we'll inventory the trees in, in May. Thank you. And Dave, can you uh, just give us, I'm sorry, let me, let me ask one quick question first. Uh, can you give us a, a summary again of, of why it was over budget and, and, and the number of trees are estimated versus actual uh, to, to give us a better idea as to what happened? Sure. The original budget for just removals alone was about $59,000. Um, we went out for a contract um, from September uh, and of 14, the inventory was completed. And at that time, which was you know the, the previous year, the trees that had declined were, was a total of about 114 trees. The contract that, was that more than the original the original estimate that was based on um, that's the budget for, to remove not only ash borer trees but also the um, just general fund trees um, anything else that and so it's about a total of 114 trees that's it's mostly ash uh, just a handful of other parkway trees um, so about 59,000 was the total budget for removal uh, that contract amount came in about 33,450 to take those 114 trees so there was a little bit more remaining it was anticipated that they could use up that budget and take down the ones that he saw this this spring um, to take those down. Um, but the number kept climbing, and uh, and his total of, of 375, uh, we put that off until the winter to get better prices. The the winter time prices for landscaping, for tree removal work um, worked to our advantage uh, because the contractors want to extend their their work season a little bit so they they can lower the prices a little bit. Trustee Francis, yes. So 375 trees this winter. Estimated 450 trees next summer. How many are left? How many are left? That are, that are, uh, un, that are untreated. Sure. After after this winter, there'll be a total of about um, 1,280 ash trees. That's 800 treated, but 480 untreated. Okay. Um, so about 5% of those 800 will be probably declined. Um, and then the remaining, almost all the 480 would probably be included in that list. Right. Um, we're finding good success with like the white ash and blue ash. Um, they're just a little more resilient on their own. So they seem to be holding up a little bit longer. Okay. And also, uh, in your opinion, and I've, I've been reading about this, but in your opinion, we're going through a wave of EAB. Once that wave has passed us and moved further west and south and north, uh, we have, may have more longevity in our trees, uh, less trees susceptible to the infestation. So experts um, estimate that, that, that by about 2019, the wave will have passed. Um, so it's important to maybe keep our treatment, our modified or our, um, our managed decline program kind of in that wake. Uh, because at that point, all the untreated ash trees, be they private, forest preserve, whatever, um, will have succumbed and died at that point. The ash borer and, and the larvae and everything will have kind of moved out of the area. They'll always be around, but they'll just be around in a lower concentration. You forecasted, or it's been forecasted 2019. Right, but then, uh, the you know, way. treating at least uh, aggressively through that period and then a little bit more kind of prolongs the ash trees in our urban forest. Very good, thank you. And the root drenching treatment, is that done annually or every other year? That's an annual treatment program. Annually, yeah. um, some homeowners, and it's a little bit more expensive, have an injection program, and that's every other year. Okay. Our root drench program is annual. Thank you. Okay. Any other Professor Francis? Uh, Steve, where were the $32,000 uh, that were over budget? Where would that come from? Well, it's from the general fund. Um, you know, we've been holding money uh, for purposes of, of the state and the concerns we have there. So we, we will have, and we did, even absent that, have a surplus of $85,000, I think, this year. Is that, or is it 65, one of the two? But um, so there's money still there uh, to cover this cost. This, uh, along with the, the boiler, uh, was are the two items, the big items right now that go over budget. The other item that usually, you know, could, very uh, would be salt, um, depending on the kind of winter that sure. we have. Um, but right now we don't, you know, we have no idea. We think we'll be in good shape as far as that goes. But in terms of commodities, 
things like this. Um, I don't expect any big ticket items to uh, to go over. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. <coughs> Any other discussion on that? Or a yeah, motion. Motion, that motion to, uh, to uh, direct staff to, uh, to prepare the paperwork for that. May I have a motion to, uh, uh, to approve that? Well, I don't like spending the money, but I don't think we have a choice, so I make a motion to approve the low bid for uh, winter 2015-16. For Desidero Landscaping. May I have a second, please? Second. May I have a second? Roll call, please. Tracy Grasso. Yes. Tracy Murphy. Yes. Tracy Schiappa. Yes. Tracy Francis. Yes. Tracy Paveza. Yes. Tracy Bolas. Yes. Six zero. Okay. Motion passes six zero. Sorry, the, the projected surplus is about eighty thousand. Thank you. Now, under, under considerations, we have uh, 8B, presentation of proposed 2015 tax levy. Right, so yes, have... I will handle that. And uh, above uh, on the screen, you have our proposed uh, tax levy. Um, the um, counties have uh, come up with the uh, normal formula for what the uh, tax will be allowed to be increased under the tax cap this year. It's 8 tenths of 1%. That's how much we can increase uh, our tax, plus any new uh, uh, construction uh, value. Now, as, as you know, um, we always aim high uh, to uh, make sure that we can uh, receive uh, all the maximum amount of dollars that we can under the tax cap. So first thing we do is we uh, increase uh, the EAV. And again, these are all estimates that we're talking about here is in terms of uh, coming up with a formula and a number uh, by, and as I say, we are aiming high. So we increase the EAV, 2% uh, increase in value, 4% new construction, so 6%. So that helps us ensure that we will aim high. Next, we, we uh, develop the um, uh, limiting rate, and I'll, I'll tell you, talk about that calculation in a minute. But we're uh, de determined, uh, again, for estimating purposes, that it would be around 0.1089. So with that, the first thing we do with the plug the numbers we plug in, remember there are three levies, the corporate levy, the police protection levy, and the police pension levy. The first number we plug in is the police pension levy. Uh, the number that you see uh, that's extended 697,784 uh, is the uh, state requirement uh, based on our actuaries um, calculations uh, to fund the pension fund 90% by the year 2040. Um, you heard Mr. White suggest that we should follow the GASB uh, uh, number. That's a number also in the actuary uh, report. Uh, that number uh, is, is obviously higher. Um, and, and then the uh, pension board, just for information, I passed that information, was in the Friday memo. Uh, they are requesting $852,927 uh, dollars. That is a normal cost plus uh, interest on the accrued liability, um, and so that's how they, that number is uh, arrived at. But the number we've plugged in is our state requirement, 697,784. And then whatever's left over, uh, based on what we think we would we'd be able to, uh, to receive, uh, we split it 60% uh, corporate uh, levy, 40% police protection levy. And this year, uh, based on uh, all these numbers, uh, the um, corporate levy would be 276991 and the police protection levy would be $184,660. So with all this said, um, and with these projections, we're anticipating an increase of $53,081 over the previous year, uh, or a 4.8% uh, um, increase. Again, will we receive all of these dollars, as I, as I mention every year? Uh, no, we do not receive all those dollars. Okay, why does that keep doing that? Let's see here. Okay, we'll go up here. Last year, <coughs> if you recall, uh, we estimated um, uh, 
334,832 in corporate, 223, 222 in police protection, and 593,000 for police pension. And, and you see that in the first column. The second column of numbers are what actually came in. The third column, you see the variation. You can see that we actually got in $44,700 less uh, than we anticipated. <coughs> and they say we always aim high, we always get something less. I said that last year, I say that every year, but uh, this year, uh, looking at last year's numbers, we came in $44,700 less. The main reason for that is not so much that we missed out on the limiting rate. We were pretty close on the limiting rate, but obviously the EAV didn't go up as much as we anticipated. And therefore, those were all, those were, that was the maximum amount of tax dollars that we could, that we could uh, receive. Okay. This chart um, just shows the history of the um, EAV throughout uh, uh, the last um, 25 to 27 years or so. Um, you can see in, in the early years, you know, inc substantial increases uh, every year in the EAV. The EAV was always going up. The rate was always going down, except starting in 2009, during the right after the recession. For five years in a row, the EAV in Burr Ridge went down. This past year, the EAV went up for the first time in five years, but only 1.96%. And you can see our estimate this year is 6%. We won't get there. We know that, uh, but we are just projecting high so that, as I say, we can garner all the uh, dollars we can under the tax cap. This is the limiting rate calculation. You take the base aggregate extension of $1,106,354, multiply it by that eight tenths of 1% that I mentioned was the, um, uh, the uh, cost of living. Um, and then, and that's one side of the calculation. The other side of the calculation is you take last year's EAV. We increase it by 2% um, uh, for val increase in value, and that comes out to one million twenty four. Thousand thirty-two, one million, one billion twenty-four million thirty-two thousand three hundred thirty-two dollars, and that's so. When you divide that first number into the second number, you get a limiting rate calculation of 0 0.1089. So that's basically how we are estimating the limiting rate. The limiting rate will be what the counties tell us it'll be based on the EAV, uh, but for purposes of, of uh, calculating an estimate, that's um, how we will do it. Last year, as I say, we were one one thousandths of um, a point off uh, in estimating the limiting rate. Uh, it was, as I say, just the EAV that was, didn't come in as high as we anticipated that, that dropped our numbers down. This is just a truth in taxation calculation. Um, we have to hold a public hearing. If we're over 5%, we're actually at 4.80 but the village always holds a public hearing, so you know, it really doesn't, it doesn't matter. I keep wanting to go there. Um, this is an important chart that, that shows the difference between the uh, extended levy in 14 to the proposed levy in 15. You can see that the police pension levy went up $128,543 this year. There are two main reasons for that. We knew there was going to be an increase, but the, the, the reason for that large increase is the fact that the year before, um, it was based on 26 officers. And the reason why is that, that the, the snapshot that the actuary takes is on like April 1st. And, and at that time, there were, we had one less officer, we just hadn't replaced that position. So he used that lower number so the increase didn't go up as much last year. This year now it, it's gone up um, be, because we do have that extra officer. Now we know that Angie is the extra officer that we haven't filled, but on, she, she was here on April 1st. And so, so even when it should probably be lower, it, it actually is, is higher this year because she was here on, on that April 1st. If we don't approve the filling of that position next year, um, then, then the levy will, will show a decline, uh, at least a, a reduction uh, for that officer. The other uh, reason for the increase uh, is, you know, there are many different um, uh, numbers that go into the formula for uh, calculating the, 
the, the contribution, and one is interest rates. Um, and the standard in the industry for several years has been around seven and a quarter. Uh, the um, standard industry has, has been reduced, that number has been reduced to 7%, so our actuary who you know, looks at that trend um, has decided to reduce that. And so when you, when you anticipate less money coming into the fund, that's the reason why um, there's an increase in, the, um, in, in what we have to pay. So that's why it went up $128,543. So what do we do? We're taking that $53,081 of extra tax money this year, putting it toward the police pension levy, 100% of that. But in addition, in order to fund the police pension levy, we have to reduce the corporate levy and the police protection levy. So you can see those are two general fund numbers. So if all things were equal here, uh, we would start next year in the general fund with $75,000 less because we are putting that money in the pension fund. Now, in addition, remember what I keep saying, we never get our full $53,000 number. Uh, let's say we get a half that. Um, that's 75,000 becomes 100,000. So again, we're gonna start the fiscal year in a general fund with $100,000 less than we started it uh, this year because of the increase in, in, in the pension levy. And that's just based on, again, the state requirement of 697. <coughs> this, we always show this uh, chart on, on how much we're talking about. And again, we're not talking about a lot of money here at all. For a resident who has a $600,000 market value in 2014, if it goes up by that 2%, as we estimate, and it, then their EAV would go up to $612,000. Uh, the increase um, in DuPage County, we're talking about if we received all the dollars that we're talking about, is a dollar and 86 cents. That's what we're talking about raising taxes. Uh, our portion of the village tax is a dollar 86. Two dollars and 43 cents in Cook County. So talk a lot about these numbers, but that's really what it means, just uh, under basically $2 uh, per resident. Um, and we always like to show the dollar bill and show where all the dollars are going. Obviously, 67 cents of everybody's dollar in, in Burr Ridge uh, goes to the schools. Residents feel like they pay a lot of money in taxes, but obviously uh, only less than 3% comes to the village. Uh, the vast majority go to the schools, the fire department, uh, the county, and so forth. Be happy to answer any questions anybody has regarding the tax levy. Concerns about the pension amounts that we're levying for. Um, it seems like that deficit is increasing and increasing and increasing. Now, it is a little disheartening not to have the police pension board make a presentation tonight as we had been used to in the past. I would have liked to, to hear their comments um, and, and see what they have to say. But it, it appears we have a sheet here where they did seem to ex ex or accept the um, pension, uh, pension contribution of the normal cost plus interest on the unfunded liability of the 852. And I realize that that may be a little aggressive, but I'm wondering if we can do an alternate levy where we do follow GASB. What does that do to our numbers? Uh, I've got that chart. <coughs> Just have to find it now. Jerry, help me. Is that it right here? Okay. Yeah, the, the three numbers that we're talking about is the state requirement 697, 784. Um, the GASB number 798, 544. The pension board's number of um, 852,927. And let's see here. If you look at the three uh, calculations here. Um, if, uh, if we went with the uh, GASB number, uh, we would be losing 175,000 plus, as I say, probably half that 53, probably $200,000. And so instead of a $100,000 loss, we'd probably be at $200,000 loss um, in, in the corporate fund if we were to go with the GASB number. 
you can see that the uh, under the state law, the pension, uh, the amount of the police pension is uh, 51 was last year 51.5 percent of the uh, tax levy. This year, under the state law, it's 60.2. If you went to GASB, it would be almost 69 percent. Uh, and again, if you went to the um, um, normal cost plus interest, that would that would go up to 73 uh, percent, and that number would be um, almost 250,000 over 275,000 dollars more. Steve, you mentioned the 69 percent and uh, 60 percent. Are they? I don't I don't catch them on the, uh, on the diagram the, right now. The, look at the pie charts. Okay, so if look at the pie charts, you see that. Bot oh, okay. 51 and oh, 14. Oh, the bottom. Okay, okay. 50. Is that um, the uh, last, the third one? Right, 60.2. I mean, the bottom line is I, I, I believe that um, we're on track. We're, we're over 70% funded. Um, we have a lot of priorities in this village. Uh, I think we are meeting our, we're meeting our obligation um, in terms of uh, putting money in the police pension fund. Um, we can't afford at this moment to be putting more money in because, again, it's a zero-sum game. Every extra dollar you put in the police pension fund, that's one less dollar that goes into the general fund. And as it is, I'm talking about $100,000 less. If you go with GASB, uh, you're talking about $200,000 less. That's two police officers. You want, you want two police officers there on the street, or do you want to sock more money in the pension fund and, and eliminate two police officers? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Just the concern is that debt is increasing ever so rapidly. And for a small village, it's, it's quite and, a bit and of debt. Just as an aside, um, you remember I talked quite a bit about the, um, the Pension Reform uh, Act. <clears throat> Um, and, and, you know, we, we went for a referendum and 88.5% of the residents supported that referendum. If that hadn't happened in this, this levy that we'd be talking about, the police pension levy would be over $1.2 million. And it would have been over $1 million probably for the last, uh, at least the last three years. So with, with that in mind, over 100% of the levy would be going toward the pension, and then you would have to find additional dollars to cover the pension. And that's what would have happened if there was not reform. And so you're talking about, you know, half a million, 600,000 or more dollars that the, that the general fund would be short that we'd be putting into the, into the police pension fund. We couldn't afford that. Roads wouldn't get built. As I say, police officers would, be, would have to be laid off. We, 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 something had to happen, and it did happen, fortunately, um, and I think we're on the right track now. Um, and even with the major increase that we received this year in the uh, uh, pension fund, um, for reasons that I stated, uh, that this number is still half of what it would have been uh, had the reform not taken place back in 2010-11. Can we get a copy of that chart you had earlier? Which which chart? That shows. I, I don't. One, I don't have that. this one. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't have it here that we don't. No. Have. No. No. I, that was something new that we just did. Um, but we can make copies for you. Or put it on SharePoint to further understand it. Yep. Now, obviously, this is just discussion tonight. Right. Um, um, I need direction from the board to hold a public hearing based on the numbers that I'm proposing. So I do need a motion for that. Uh, then we will hold a public hearing first meeting in December. Uh, and once the public hearing is, is held, then I will ask for a vote to approve the levy. Trustee Francis. Um, Trustee Bowles hit on it earlier that uh, there's nobody here from the police pension board to discuss their request for $852,000. I'd like to know why they believe their number is correct, why they're in agreement with Mr. White, and why uh, they believe that what uh, the village administration has proposed is, is incorrect. So if we could have a representative at the next budget hearing meeting. Well, I think, the, Jerry, you go to those meetings and um, they voted to approve this number, but they also agreed that they wouldn't make a presentation. Jerry, can you grab the, uh, come up with the microphone, please? 
The pension, pension board uh, chose, voted on uh, just supplying the memo I think Steve gave you and then their recommendation on that and uh, evaluation by the you, actuary. You have their memo. I, I copied it here. So no, I have it. it. I, I, I kind of read it. But I'd like to know why they think they're right and why they think you're wrong, why the village administration is wrong. So I, I have Mr. White's reasons why. He's got six pages of reasons why that I'm going to read. Well, I think, I but, think the uh, reason they think they're wrong, they want a little bit more money. I mean, as, as you, everybody knows, the state's about as messed up as possible. Talking about Burr Ridge, not the state. Okay, but why, well, it's again, happening should all over Burr Ridge the state, be though, probably it's not one Ridge. of the only <clears throat> villages that are going to 80, 90 percent? We're over 70, which is way more than any, anybody else. And Brand in 70. respect, uh, if we follow these formats, either one or two things happen. Our village people have to pay more taxes or we have less village services. That's correct. But we can't raise the taxes. I understand the math. Well, no, I, I mean, we can always raise it, but uh, I'm not for it. We can't raise, we're non-home rule, we can't raise taxes. No, but what you're doing is you're reducing the amount of services. Fund. We'll and have to reduce services. Doing that, services. I understand all that math. I understand that. I just want to know the reasons why. The police pension board feels that their number is correct. That's well, all. I can I inject um, the police pension board. At least it's my understanding that their sole issue is funding the pension system. They don't have to consider whether we have to continue building our roads and if we have to cut down our um, our ash trees and if we want to pay the police we have on staff and don't want to cut any any patrolmen off the roads. So, you know, they are solely focused on getting as much money in that pension fund that they can. I mean, that makes sense, right? That is their issue. But we have to weigh staying in business. If the policemen are let go because we don't have <coughs> enough money, they can go to another village and work for another village and the pension goes with them. So this pension, you know, is, is theirs, and I understand that, and I'd love to be able to pay them 100%, but we have to keep moving forward and, and pay our bills. Oh. Of know? course. Okay. But we have a board, a pension board. I'd like to hear them yeah. speak why they think that their levy number is correct. That's well, we'll, we'll ask just, I, Let me. Um, I just want to understand their reasoning, okay? And that, that's, asking, a, that's a great question. I think. asking too much? No. No. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why they're not here tonight, uh, regardless. But uh, Jerry, uh, do you have any uh, any? Uh, could you put into into you know, uh, layman's language, uh, perhaps some of the reasons that, that that weighed into why they thought theirs was uh, considerably you know, so much higher than than, the, than your recommendation? Uh, could you give us a, a quick uh, description of that? No. <laughs> Uh, Not a quick description, okay. Well, I, we have uh, the three numbers, uh, and each of them are different. You have the state law, 90% uh, uh, by 2040. You have uh, the, uh, the Gasby number, which we use for our audit, as if, you know, the number, uh, it would be 100% by 2040. And then you have the third number, uh, which is... Uh, the normal cost plus interest, you know, to kind of maintain the unfunded liability from, from growing. So those are the three numbers. Um, as far as their recommendation, uh, they want the higher number. Um, and um, they just wanted to put it in a memo this year and not do a presentation. So I, again, I think the, the answer is, is it was it was touched on is, is that they, they've got this concern regarding the increase in the, in the unfunded liability. And the 852 number um, equates to, um, you know, the normal cost that you would have to put in the pension fund on a yearly basis, plus um, um, the interest on the the, uh, uh, the unfunded liability. So interest on this year on the 6.3 million dollars. Um, and so the, the, what they wanted to do was stop the unfunded liability from increasing. But again, this is the plan on this page that I'm showing here. Um, and we've talked about it before. It's the so-called ramp plan that I understand fully, but what Mr. White says is probably not a good thing to have happen is the unfunded liability goes up, 
substantially before it goes down, even though we're putting more money into the system. Um, but again, what we're putting in um, is, you know, reasonable increases on an annual basis for the current residents to have to pay. Um, my contention would be that you're, you're asking the residents today uh, to, um, to pay more than I think they need to pay uh, for future years. Um, again, based on this plan, and lots of things can go wrong, recessions can happen, and they do happen. Um, uh, but the last couple of years, we've actually received more in interest than we anticipated. So there's going to be good years and bad years. Um, but at the end of the, the, the period here, in 2040, we should be 90% funded. And when we are 90% funded in, in, in the year 2040, notice that there will be over $49 million in the pension fund at that time. And uh, there still will be a $4.9 million unfunded liability. So even with this, you know, when we get to that point and we're at 90% in 2040, we're still going to be 4.9% or $4.9 million with unfunded liability. So again, I'm not as concerned about these paper numbers as Mr. White is and, and, and the, um, the pension board is. Um, and again, even in a worst case scenario, let's say by the year 2040, we're still only 70% funded. No different than we're at today. The sky isn't falling today on the pension system. And, and I think that, that we would still be in, in relatively good shape. Remember, there is a two-tiered system now uh, in, in, in the state of Illinois for, for police officers. We already have five or six of those officers in that second tier. Less benefits. And the reason why, you know, the state of Illinois is bankrupt in terms of pension and so forth, and especially why the police pension, in my estimation, is bankrupt, uh, is, is because of the sweeteners that the state legislature put on the pension system over the course of the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were down in Springfield. I can guarantee you <laughs> I was there along with all the mayors and managers back then telling the legislators, don't do this. It's, gonna have, it's called an unfunded mandate. And, and it's going to have an impact on municipalities. And they went ahead and did it anyway, and now we're suffering uh, the consequences of that. Fortunately, as I say, because of the Tax Reform Act, I think there's a method and a way forward uh, to be able to, to pay our obligation uh, in a way that doesn't totally mess up our general fund budget and allows us to, to go ahead and pay the day-to-day -day expenses of this organization. Steve, as far as those sweeteners that were passed by the legislature, uh, can you uh, uh, give us some examples of some of the ones that uh, went through? Well, the big one is the 3% compounding uh, of, of the pension. So every year it's 3% on the previous number as opposed to 3% on the beginning number uh, that, that they start their pension at. That's how it is for all of our RMRF employees. Um, if you start, yeah, say you get um, a, a pension of, say, $3,000 a month, um, that it's only three, three. It's only three percent on that three thousand. It's not three percent on the three thousand plus the three percent right. plus the three percent plus the three percent. That's a that's a major uh, uh, benefit uh, that um, was added that costs a considerable amount of money. Uh, another um, uh, is the fact that uh, that when an officer dies, their spouse still continues to get a hundred percent funding. So the officer could live to age 70, the wife could live to age 90 or 95, and we're going to continue to pay that pension at 100%. That's not in my pension system, in IRMRF. It gets immediately reduced by 50%. Okay? So, so that's another example. Um, and, of course, you, you know, that officers can retire at age 50 with 20 years of service. What pension system that you know of, can, you can do that. Um, you know, it, there's... There's just a few of the examples. Now, I was told one time that that the uh, uh, based on all these sweeteners and all these uh, things that, that were passed in Springfield, that a an officer is it's it's calculated that an officer will actually break even uh, uh, in about three years, uh, three maybe three or four years from all the all the money they paid into their pension versus all that they will have received in the first three years of retirement. Do you, I, I, it, I that, haven't done any calculations to, to, to prove that out. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if, if they're at 65% on, on the first year, uh, how, how many years will it take to get to 100% with 3% compounding? Um, I 
think it'd be more than three or four years, but it would eventually, you know, they would. Isn't IMRF minimum funding cost I'm plus? I'm sorry, Trustee Bolas, what was that? Isn't the IMRF minimum funding cost plus interest? Jerry, that would be a question for you. Could you repeat I thought, the question? I thought the, the minimum funding calculation for IMRF was the uh, cost plus the interest. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. So they're they're calculating it that way. On our books, we follow the GASB rules, correct? Well, for the financial for audit, financials. you know, the, that is a reporting requirement to cost it out as if the uh, state law was 100% by 2040. And that would be the 798 yes. number? Yeah, and again, GASB is a national organization. They don't take into consideration what goes on here in the state of Illinois or in the village of Burr Ridge. Um, it's 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 a great it's a great number, uh, and and it's understood. But again, we have our own problems here, uh, and and we can't just put our head in the sand and say let's pay that extra number just because it sounds good, or because you know it makes the pension board feel better. Um, we've got real other priorities that we have to meet. If we didn't have this, the, 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 the fact that we're having a hard time balancing the budget, if we didn't have the fact that we don't have a, a, a revenue source to cover uh, the road program on an annual basis, uh, if we didn't have you know, the state threats of taking our way our LGDF, um, and we ended up the year with a surplus, and we, you know, we didn't have any other use for that money, then I would say, okay, if you want to, go ahead. Uh, put that money in the pension fund. Otherwise. If, if this bill board felt so strongly that we had to put more money in the pension fund, I would say take it out of equity. You don't have to put it in the pension. You don't have to put it in the levy. Just take it out of the equity. You've got four point, you have four million dollars in equity. Take it out of equity. It, it's it, 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 what's that, that's really the stopgap. You've got that money sitting there. It's in the general fund. If for some reason the pension fund fails. You can put a, you could take a million dollars of that and put it right in there, plus the tax levy. All of a sudden, those numbers will look really good. But, but why do that now when we don't? When I don't think you need to do that. We uh, we don't. And when I say we, uh, Jerry and I looked at these numbers. We know what we're talking about. We believe we know what we're talking about. I believe strongly that you could have any village manager in DuPage County sitting here tonight, and they would tell you exactly the same thing I'm telling you. So I mean, I'm telling you anything that's wild and crazy. I'm telling you what exactly what everybody else would tell you and what they're telling their village boards. I, I don't disagree with you and I understand the concepts. I mean, it would be great to be able to put more money into the pension. It's just that this is the same presentation, the same thing, and you do hear this year after year. And when I, I've been sat through tax levies for many, many years. And uh, the, the pension board last year told us the same thing and they were chastised for telling us the same thing. And you're right, the pension board's obligation is to pay attention to the, to the pension. So I, I think we shouldn't have chastised them last year for set, telling us what they're supposed to do. That is their job. <clears throat> it's, you know, we've had this problem year after year after year, and uh, the thing I look at, I just can't see, uh, Steve made the comment, that today's residents mm -hmm. have to pay more taxes or have to have less village services to pay money into a pension that's not required. I mean, that's my thinking. I don't see how, you know, I'm trying to figure where I'm wrong on that, you know, but I, I just can't see where, you know, that the residents that are here today in the village have to either pay more taxes or get less village services because a few people want to, our pension is just up to begin with, but they want to put more money into the pension and it's not necessary. We are mandated by the state to put in so much money, which we do, and our pension liability, if I'm not wrong, Steve, we're, we're probably uh, higher, higher rated than most villages. Well, this is the chart that we showed last year. We updated the numbers. Well, we're still the third um, the best community in terms of uh, funding ratio. Two communities above us, Hinsdale and Willowbrook, all these other communities are, 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 are less than us. So I do think, we're, relatively speaking, we're in, we're in good shape. Uh, and obviously, we watch it every year. Every year, things change, just like this year. Some numbers change. Next year, they'll change again. Um, and you know, remember, when you add police officers, not only are you impacting the general fund budget, 
you're impacting the police pension costs. And, and um, next year, if that position isn't filled, we'll probably save thirty to forty thousand dollars in in the pension levy because of that decision. So um, again, they, it, those decisions have an impact. Mm. Trustee Schiappa? Well, I think in, in the environment that we're in today, I mean, earlier this evening we passed a resolution for the state to pay us our money. Uh, and it's a, it's a real issue that we have that impacts our budget. Um, although I think it would be great to follow the GASB standards in regards to contributing to the pension program, I think it would be in our best judgment to follow prudence and 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 go with the recommendation of the administration, just to 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 keep an eye on our budget so that we can pay our officers, pave our streets, uh, we can have our great pathway program, and and keep our services up. And then actually, I had a question for Jerry. How does Gab Gasby come up with 100% at 2040? Why isn't it 2030 or 2050? Or that uh, governmental accounting standard boards, uh, you know, had a pronouncement, and it was determined uh, that with a better valuation in the annual audit to be a, at 100%. I mean, you know, 100% is always good, you know, but. Right. You know, also management, as Steve said, has a lot of priorities here to look at other things. So um, can we afford to be 100% by 2040? And 2040 is the state law. So again, they're at 90% by 2040. That's the state That's law. That's the state law. So but... Gasby is just saying, okay, if 2040 is the year, we okay. want it to be 100%. That's, okay. that's, that's right. their, their position. So they're taking the state law recommendation and putting it at 100%. All right, I understand. Final comments, uh, Trustee Murphy, do you have anything else to add? Um, I would agree, I think, with Al and with Steve that we should go with the actuary numbers because that's what's recommended by state law. We're meeting our le legal requirement there. Um, so I think we should go forward with that recommendation. Okay. Is he bolus? do you have any final comments? Anything to add? Anything to add? You know, I mean, we see what the state has done with their minimal requirements and what their financial shape they're in. So I, I, I don't see how we can we can play with this. I, I would like to study that uh, the different Gasby, Gasby first. yeah, the, to see how they the numbers there a little bit more in detail. But I, I don't know. I don't. It would be nice to to be able to fund that a little bit more. I'd like to see ours. A little bit higher our um, funded ratio. Okay. Not saying that it's prudent to do it at this time, but. Uh, Trustee Pavesa, do you have anything else to add? No, I, I said I just can't see any putting any increase over the state recommendations on the back of our residents. Okay. Trustee Grosso. I agree with following the state's recommendations. I hesitate to go into our equity uh, with the general fund equity or the Irma surplus or the even the Opus Street Bridge. I don't want to go into any of that. I like that money for a rainy day. If we need it down the road to supplement the pension fund, we'll use it. But once it's gone, it's gone. It reminds me when my kids were encouraging them to you know save some money. And I'd say, if you've got money in the bank, you can dream to spend it on X, Y, or Z. When you're young, you can buy a new toy. When you get older, you can think about saving up for a car or college or something. And when you get older, you dream to save up for a down payment on a house. But once that money is spent, your dreams are gone. You can't hope or dream until you build it up again of what you're going to spend that money on. So I really don't want to go into our equity or surplus funds. I just want to leave that there until we have no other choice. Trustee Francis. Um, I think we all understand that uh, if commitments to the pension fund are increased, that uh, with, with the same constant or very close to constant levy taxes that we receive, that services would have to decrease. But I think it's unfair to the residents that we scare them by saying we're going to have to cut a police officer or two. There's other, way, other areas that could be cut, such as beautification, gateway beautification, or concerts or something else that doesn't impact the safety of the residents. So I don't appreciate the scare tactic of cutting a police officer or two. I think we should stay away from that. 
nobody in, on this board wants to cut a police officer. Nobody, no resident wants to cut a police officer too. So let's stay away from that. And I also agree not to dip into assets to cover this, but we have to find other ways to, to, to fund to fund this police pension problem. Okay, I, I, I have to comment. I understand what you're saying. Okay. There's lots of things that you can cut other yeah. than police officers, Yes. but beautification is not one of them, and concerts are not one of them. Why? Because it comes out of the hotel motel tax fund. Okay. So it's already out of the general fund. Okay, then. So I don't want people to misunderstand Thank that. you for clearing that up. Okay. But there will be other areas where cuts could be made uh, so that we don't have to cut a police officer and we don't jeopardize the safety of our residents. Someone need a motion? Nope. Motion to, to direct staff to prepare the necessary public hearing document um, based on the numbers that we presented. So moved. Second. Any other further discussion on the motion? No. Why not? People can talk to him. It, it's at the board already. It's at the board. Because she ignored him. And it's it's. May I have a roll call, please? Trustee Schiappa. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Bolas. Yes. Trustee Paveza. Yes. Trustee Grasso. Yes. Trustee Francis. Yes. Six zero. Okay, motion passes six zero. Under considerations L, other considerations, pronouncement, deliberation, and or discussion only. No, no official action will be taken. Is there anything else to be added? That's next. I, I have we an have item. Um, in the hotel motel tax fund budget, we have $4,500 budgeted uh, for Reese that we were going to put on the, um, uh, on the uh, columns. Um, now, Trustee uh, Grasso had suggested we look into the possibility of uh, increasing the amount of lighting on those columns because you can only see them from one direction as you're driving. Um, in one direction, you see that the first two columns are lit up, but the last two are not. And then when you come from the other direction. Actually, well, they're, not, they're not lit up on the inside. They're lit uh, up on the outside. And so it's in order to improve the lighting, uh, we got some estimates of about $6,000 or so, 65. I'm sorry? 12,000. Oh, 12,000. 6,000 more. Three for each pillar. Oh, there's four pillars. Three, I'm sorry, $12,000. Okay. Um, Something we can consider um, this year or next year. Um, we could use that $4,500 toward that uh, if, um, if, if you wanted to do that this year and, and take more money out of the hotel motel tax fund. Um, another consideration, um, if the state lets us do it, and we will find out, we haven't been able to find that out yet, is we thought maybe at Christmas time we could change the lights from white to green, for example. I don't know if anybody has any interest in that, but you could put a film over the bulbs and, and um, how much would that cost? A few hundred dollars? Yeah. Um, and, and if the state would allow us to do that, it would be a decorative thing for Christmas time. So obviously we, we couldn't approve that $12,000 now, but I just wanted to get some direction to see what, you know, if, if we're gonna do the wreath, we should probably, do, that we can do under, the, it's under 5,000, we can go ahead and do that. Um, and um, get that done in time for Christmas holidays. Um, if you want to hold off on that wreath, we can do that. Um, if you want, if you direct me to put this on the next agenda, if you want to spend the extra money for the extra lighting, we can do that, uh, or we can budget for it next year. I'm just looking for some direction. What? Where is the wreath supposed to go? The wreath would go on the columns. I thought we can't hang anything on the columns. On the inside, yes. On the inside. Just not on the bridge. Oh, not on the bridge. Okay. okay. Any suggestions, questions of Steve? Clarification needed? Uh, you're screaming about money, and now you want to get yeah, $12,000. This is hotel motel <laughs> no, tax money. It doesn't matter. We can't use hotel motel tax money to fund the pension system. I understand that, but I'm saying, I mean. So, again, we're so talking about we getting two the different extra things. The difference between the 4500 we have and the 12000 that it's going to cost. Well, it would be out of the surplus in the hotel motel tax fund. And there's there's money in the hotel motel tax fund for that amount if we wanted to do that. 
But that's not that, really up for discussion now. No, uh, but I, if I'm looking for direction. You think that's a good idea? I'll put it on the next agenda. Uh, I, I think I'd much rather have lighting. For, 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 I'd much rather for, have for, a, for further discussion. Right. Not, we're not. This is not a, a topic for discussion right now. You're just asking if you want to discuss it. Yes. To put on the agenda. Yes. Okay. And again, if you want to do the Reese, now is the time to tell me because we've got to get that going. Otherwise, it won't be in time for Christmas. Um, if you ask my my feeling, my personal feeling is that I think we'd rather see additional lighting. That would be forever on the on the bridge uh, on the on the columns then. And the wreaths that you only see uh, for a month out of the year. Uh, and we can always do those wreaths later on in another fiscal year. But uh, I mean, I've been told that the lighting should be improved, and I think you'll get more bang for your buck if you if you did that. But I just again, I want to hear what you want. To, what you want well, to no, that's one that's one topic that we probably all I mean we, we have all looked at, but probably have to look at a little bit more is to decide whether or not that's a nice to have or must have. Uh, I know it certainly would make it look look a lot better. I, I agree with. Trustee Grasso, but the, the um, uh, probably should decide that later. Trustee Francis. Yes, thank you. Maybe you can make a presentation with all the numbers and the various options and things for us to take a look at for the next meeting. Okay, and we just came in today. These numbers. I understand. So. Uh, but yeah. that, would, that would be my recommendation for direction. Okay, good. Plus, you have to bid it, right? Beautiful bridge there, and we're going to be doing a lot for the village center. I can agree. You know, I'll put a put something together so we can vote on it and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll that will improve the image of the bridge even more. To provide more information for a better, for an educated decision. Okay, good. So that's what I was looking for. Okay. It has to be out to bid anyway, right? With that amount. Um, actually, I think we'd want to use our, the contractor that we have um, that, that, we already have a maintenance contractor in place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose we could spend the time to get additional bids, but you know, we'll have to talk about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, are there any uh, audience members, uh, residents that would like to address the board this time? And you have new information to add, Mr. White? <laughs> no, he is. He can talk for five minutes. So, I just wanted to make sure that we all understand that the uh, the pension benefits that the officers um, are entitled to in the statutes are in fact written in stone. Basically, the Supreme Court has told you that. The second thing is is that twenty one point seven million dollars in liabilities. Um, directly related to those you've bought whether you like it or not and in truth it's really like having it on a charge card every dollar additional dollar that you put on it today like Gatsby for example does two things one, three things one thing that it does is is it pays down that deficit second thing that it does is it provides some more assets that we can then invest and hopefully in the long term not every year but hopefully in the long term you know raise some additional appreciation, interest, whatever. Um, the third thing that it does is, is it makes your financial report look better. I mean, now you're in a position where at some point in time, the village needs to go out and borrow money. It would be nice to have a financial report that would say, okay, rather than just, I don't know, whatever your unfunded liability was on, on the last 111 million, whatever it might be, when everything was added together, IMRF and ours and, and the uh, other uh, post-employment benefits, um, that if you are in fact, you know, realizing that we need to do something there, and I would hope again, living in Illinois, you have to realize that we have to do something. We really do. And, but in any event, if you had that in the financial report, I think that would be a good thing and people would look at that when they're, they're considering, uh, you know, purchasing a bond, for example, that you might issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to get to was this, this idea about the 100% funding and the 90% funding. It's all kind of a sham. It's kind of a sham because of the truth of the matter is, is that the real issue, well, two things. One is there'll be pressure on Gatsby. There'll be pressure on the state come 2030 to let's go out to 2060. Okay, it's going to happen. But it becomes a big Ponzi scheme whether you realize it or not. People at the end holding the ball are really in trouble. And the real problem is not getting to 2040. It's what it takes you to get there. In other words, in 2025, 
you seriously could be in a situation where it's, uh, you know, we can't afford our electric bills. I mean, it could get that bad. And what, what would make it that bad? People living longer, so you have mortality tables that increase. The financial markets, I mean, you had a financial report, if you will, from your auditors that told you, if you look at it, that our, even our 7% is too high. The minute that the 7% becomes too high and you go like the 6.5%, for example, those liabilities go way up. The reason they go up is because of the fact that the discount rate now is not 7% anymore, it's 6.5. In other words, you're trying to figure out what current amount of money you have to have to reach those liabilities. So all I'm saying is, is that you can see what's happening to the state, okay? And, and really, what we're really saying is, and I, I really believe this, we're not saying to our uh, residents you have to pay more money. We're really saying to this board that you have to do a really good job of realizing that you need to start putting more into the pension fund and whatever else you need to do to balance the budget. It might be cuts here or there, whatever, and, and I agree wholeheartedly with uh, what uh, Trustee Franzi said. You know, we can't always be saying it's going to be eliminating uh, police officers. We have to go ahead and put it in a context where um, we need to provide, obviously. We have to have priorities, obviously. And one of your priorities, believe it or not, should be, shouldn't be the sixth priority. Okay, is properly funding the pension fund, and we're not we're not doing that right now. We really aren't, and eventually, this board is going to be faced with ten years down the road, whatever it could be sooner, um, with some real dilemmas. So thank you, and thank you at least for for uh, discussing the possibility of of doing uh, a Gatsby related. And I hope when you get there, and I realize that uh, you know you have surpluses at the end of the year, and always all, there's always a place to go for it. But you need as a tr board of trustees to argue harder for some of that to get to the pension fund, or it's going to cost us dearly in the future. Thank you. Any, anyone else like to address the board at this time? The residents. Okay, seeing no one, reports and communications from village officials. Well, I would like to remind everybody that the Jingle Mingle is Saturday. All of the trustees, by the way, are invited to be in the parade. And it's, again, a wonderful family event. Um, uh, go on the website if you want to see the things that are coming up. But it starts at 4.30 to 7.30. There's a parade. There's a wonderful opportunity for our children and grandchildren to write or draw and send notes to our military. Uh, and then they get a little Santa's hat for that. So we have um, all sorts of things for people to do. And I think the weather will be much more conducive to a wonderful time. Last year was so cold. So please come out. We've got Girl Scouts walking and clowns and people on stilts and handouts, giveaways. It's wonderful. So please come. And how many vehicles in the parade this year, do you know? Oh, I don't know that. I would guess there are 10, and there's some wonderful there was, floats. There was, uh, there was quite a bit last year. Yeah, it? well, that's right. I mean, they're big, right. big trucks, and uh, the kids love it. Wonderful, wonderful floats, too. I know, um, I, I, know uh, I have something to add, too. I don't know if I, uh, Trustee Murphy wants to add anything about, about the uh, I know meeting that she was in earlier. But I'll, uh, let me jump in and talk about the vet Veterans Day event that we're going to have on uh, Wednesday uh, in honor of our veterans at our, at our memorial. It'll be at 11, 11 a.m. in honor of the, uh, uh, that the, the significance of, of that day uh, when it all started. Uh, it will be at, uh, at, the, at our Veterans Memorial. It'll be a brief ceremony, 10 minutes, maybe 15 max, uh, I would think. Uh, and plus, uh, someone sing well, a, a vocalist there as well. It'll also be followed by a, 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 a complimentary lunch provided by none other than Great American Bagel, fittingly. Uh, they'll be, uh, so anyone that can join us, uh, that would be great. It's on Wednesday at 11 11. So, anyone else like to add any, uh, anything tonight? Um, sure. So, tonight at 6 30, I went to the Park District board meeting. A lot of the Woods Pool area residents came out because the park district is considering closing down Woods Pool. And the residents, um, from what I've seen, are pretty up in arms about it. So they came and put on a big presentation for the board, um, included about six or eight children in swimming suits and swim goggles and stuff like that, um, presenting and recommending or asking the uh, 
Park District to keep the pool open. So if you are in support of that, I would ask that you buy a membership to Woods Pool um, to help them raise the money that they need to keep up, um, keep up the pool basically over time. They have to build a new roof. They have to update a few other things. So if we can build membership for them a little bit, that helps raise revenue and will help keep the pool open. Great, well, thank you. Okay, then we have the, the uh, non-resident portion. We have a non-resident that'd like to address the board this time. My name is Dolores Caesar. <clears throat> I'm a former trustee. Prior to the board meeting, I passed out the legal notices that were in the doing. The ridge is on the left, uh, and Clarendon Hills is on the right. Now, Clarendon Hills have a full page. It's readable. Is the Burridge statement readable? I can understand that perhaps part of the reason is that the village wants to save money. But I think there's also a reason uh, that perhaps people won't notice the notice and won't try to read it, which I regard as unreadable. The second thing I'd like to mention is what trail estates. At, at the October 12th meeting on uh, minutes, page 10578, Mr. McNaughton stated he feels the proposed improvements will contain a majority of the water by rerouting it. Further on the page, Mr. Pricek added that Cross Creek subdivision does have a swale located on an undeveloped lot that will serve to contain the runoff water and attention must be paid to that lot when it is developed. Now, <clears throat> uh, that happens to be my former property and I brought a plat with me tonight so you can look at it. Mr. Schlesser has already taken out over one acre, one acre of water detention, 10%. Now, Aunt Tony, you look at that and then pass it around and I like it back. I was on the plan commission a short time and I don't recall that we ever permitted a developer to let the runoff from his development go on to someone else's property. And that's what your plan commission voted for and what this board voted for at the last meeting. Now, four of you have never been on the plan commission, so you don't know too much about the plan commission. You probably have never even been to meetings. But I think that it is not right to let a, a developer take his runoff onto somebody else's property, what you're proposing with Buck Trail Drive. And you see the 10% of Cross Creek. Why do you always smirk at things I bring up? Because you're not correct, Dolores. Dolores, you have, so you have far one. off, you don't even know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, one minute left, Dolores. Uh, I would like to go on to Scott Euler's opinion about uh, my complaint being denied. And he said at the meeting, October 12th, wait, I have to find it here. No, that's not it. Mm -hmm. Well, he said at the meeting that the, the board was operating under village procedures. That's only partially correct. 
you were only operating under village procedures since you adopted that ordinance shutting me down to the end of the meeting. Prior to that, and all during the time that Grassel was village president, there was no provision. There was no distinction between resident and non-resident, but Mr. Grasso imposed it. And you did too. Uh, I noticed- Doris, your time, your time is up. Is, is something you can wrap up pretty quickly for us? Uh, well, the budget of the state is gonna be hostage until January. You all know that. <clears throat> And I noticed that there were minutes of two Veterans Committee approved. The Veterans Committee has been in existence for 14 years. I even read the motion to form it. Why aren't there, are there any women in the Veterans Committee? What action is the Veterans Committee doing to try and bring women into this group? Actually, Dolores, that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, your time is up, but the, the invitation is always open. As a matter of fact, we are looking for members uh, to join the Veterans Memorial Committee, and we certainly uh, would welcome men or women uh, to join us. So, and we hope we can join you. Hope you can join us on on, on Wednesday. Uh, but also, uh, also just for just for point of edification, uh, the, the topic on the on the on the uh, uh, the property that uh, that Dolores was talking about was also passed unanimously uh, by the plan commission and the board uh, just supported that decision, so. Well, just so everybody understands, there's no water diversion. What they were talking about is diverting water into a new retention basin. That's all they were talking about. Now the water's sheet flowing over the property. Now it'll be directed into a detention basin. That's what they were referring to. Uh, you just need a motion to adjourn. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Steve. May I have a motion um, to adjourn? I, can I oh, clarify sorry. something also? Yes. Um, at the last meeting, Dolores suggested that I was denigrating the area where McNaughton is building, and likewise the area where she had her property. However, when we looked back, we had been discussing with Mrs. Inzano for about 25 minutes the flooding issue she had in her property. McNaughton explained how he was going to take care of the, fl the water flow and get it away from the Enzanos. So I, of course, when I agreed with the proposal to accept his plat, that I said that the area would be improved. The flooding, obviously, was the discussion for the prior 25 minutes. So just to clarify that, I think most everybody understood that that was what was going on. So I'll make a motion to adjourn. adjourn. Second. Roll call, please. Trustee Grasso? Yes. Trustee Pavisa? Yes. Trustee Bolas? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Schiappa? Yes. Trustee Francis? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, God bless you. God bless uh, America. I hope you can join us on uh, Veterans Day. <laughs>